April, the Dorsets, Lily, and young Ned Silverton are on the yacht at Monte Carlo. On shore are a number of friends, among whom Lawrence Selden. Miss Bart, emerging late the next morning from her cabin, found herself alone on the deck of the Sabrina. The cushioned chairs under the wide awning showed no signs of recent occupancy, and she presently learned from the steward that Mrs. Dorset had not yet appeared, and that the gentlemen, separately, had gone ashore as soon as they had breakfasted. Supplied with these facts, Lily leaned a while over the side, giving herself up to a leisurely enjoyment of the spectacle before her. How beautiful it was, and how she loved beauty. The Dorset's invitation to go abroad had come as an almost miraculous release, and her faculty for casting off problems at, <coughs> pardon me, as easily as the surroundings in which they had arisen made the mere change from one place to another seem not merely a postponement, but a solution of her troubles. She could not have remained in New York without repaying the money that she owed to Trevor. To acquit herself, she might have even faced a marriage with Rosedale, but the accident of placing the Atlantic between herself and her obligations made them dwindle out of sight. Her two months on the Sabrina had been especially calculated to aid this solution of distance. She had been plunged into new scenes and had found in them a renewal of old hopes and ambitions. The gratification of being welcomed in high company tended to throw into the extreme background the sordid difficulties from which she had escaped. If she was faintly aware of fresh difficulties at head, she was sure of her ability to meet them. Meanwhile, she could be proud of the skill with which she had adapted herself to somewhat delicate conditions. She had reason to think that she had made herself equally necessary to her host and hostess, and if only she had seen perfectly irreproachable means of drawing a financial profit from the situation, there would have been no cloud on her horizon. The truth was that her funds, as usual, were inconveniently low, and to neither Dorset nor his wife could this vulgar embarrassment be safely hinted. Still, the need was not pressing. She could worry along with the hope of some happy change of fortune, and meanwhile life was gay and beautiful and easy. She was engaged to breakfast with the Duchess of Belshire, and before this she had sent her maid to inquire if she might see Mrs. Dorset, but the reply came back that the latter was trying to sleep. Lily understood the reason of the rebuff. Her hostess had not been included in the Duchess's invitation, though she herself had made the most loyal efforts in that direction. But her grace was impervious to hints. It was not Lily's fault if Mrs. Dorset's complicated attitudes did not fall in with the Duchess's easy gait. It was a relief to break away now and then from the Sabrina. Dorset had grown more than, unusual, more than usually morose, and Ned Silverton went about with an air that seemed to challenge the universe. The breakfast made an agreeable change, and Lily was tempted after luncheon to adjourn to the hectic atmosphere of the casino. The rooms were packed with the gazing throng, which in the afternoon trickles heavily between the tables, like the Sunday crowd in a lion house. <laughs> Lily presently saw Mrs. Wellington Bry cleaving her determined way through the doors, and in the broad wake that she left, the light figure of Mrs. Fisher falling after her like a rowboat at the stern of a tug. <laughs> Mrs. Fry pressed on, but Mrs. Fisher, as she passed Lily, broke from her towing line and let herself float to the girl's side. Lose her, she echoed, a minute. Right, we've got six coming. Lose her. Lose her, she echoed, with an indifferent glance at Mrs. Bry's retreating back. I dare say it doesn't matter. I have lost her already. She added, we had an awful row this morning. You know, of course, that the Duchess chucked her at dinner last night, and she thinks it was my fault. The worst of it is, the message came so late that the dinner had to be paid for, and Bicasson had run it up. It had been so drummed into him that the Duchess was coming. Mrs. Fitcher indulged a faint laugh. Paying for what she doesn't get wrangles so dreadfully with Louisa. I can't make her see that it's one of the preliminary steps to getting what you haven't paid for. And she smashed me to atoms, poor dear. Lily murmured her commiseration. 
If there's anything I can do, if it's a question of meeting the Duchess, I heard her say she thought Miss, Mr. Bry amusing. Oh, never mind the Brys. It's you I'm thinking of, said Mrs. Fisher abruptly. You know we all went on to Nice last night when the Duchess chucked us. Miss Bart assented. Yes, I caught sight of you on the way back. Well, the man who was in the carriage with you and George Dorset, that horrid little dabham who does society notes from the Riviera, had been dining with us at Nice, and he's telling everybody that you and Dorset came back alone after midnight. Alone? When he was with us? Her laugh faded into gravity under the prolonged implication of Mrs. Fisher's look. We did come back alone, if that's so very dreadful. But whose fault was it? Bertha got bored with the show and went off early, promising to meet us at the station. We turned up on time, but she didn't turn up at all. Miss Bart made this announcement in the tone of one who presents, with a careless assurance, a complete vindication. But Mrs. Fisher received it in a matter almost inconsequent. Her inward vision had taken another slant. Bertha never turned up at all. Then how on earth did she get back? Oh, by the next train, I suppose. At any rate, I know she's safe on the yacht, though I haven't seen her. But you see, it was not my fault, Lily summed up. Not your fault that Bertha didn't turn up? My poor child, if only you don't have to pay for it. Mrs. Fisher rose. She had seen Mrs. Bry surging back in her direction. There's Louisa, and I must be off. We're on the best of terms, externally. We're lunching together. But at heart, it's me she's lunching on, she explained. 